We are here with a good looking fellow there. We we try to connect a couple times this morning. We finally made it work. Uh, Greg Godovitz, it's nice to have you here on the podcast. And uh, you've been in this business for a couple of years. And uh, 57 years. 57. Sarah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, I just tur- I just turned 70 on, uh, on March 20th. Wow, congratulations. Uh, yeah, it's uh, actually, you know, I wasn't looking forward to it. I was sort of depressed about it. And as it turned out, it was the best birthday I've ever had in my life. I mean, everything just went, you know, I got messages from all over the world, like from Cambodia, I got, wow. you know, and Japan and Australia. And, you know, when it's you, you don't really think of yourself like that, you know? Yeah. And all of a sudden, this absolute outpouring of love came shooting our way. Isn't that nice? And then we ended up in a... I was doing one of these with all my my uh, my gal, Mrs. Claypool. I can't remember her real name. Uh, she set it up where we had about twenty five people once again from all over the place that have yeah. had a big impact on my life. And we had a Zoom party that went till the early hours, and it was just a great great experience. Isn't that neat? Yeah, it's it's funny how things have changed as far as communication. You know, during COVID and this idea of being able to meet like this and have a conversation and, and, you know, meet with fellow people from all over the world. It really has changed communication a lot. I mean, it's, I think we've advanced several years in, in a year, right. As far as all that stuff, it's, it's pretty well, interesting. You know, you look at Star Trek and all the innovations that went into that with, you know, flick, flipping open your phone and talking to the computer and stuff. Yeah. And that's exactly what's happened. That's what, why we're doing this. I mean, this was science fiction 20 years ago, yeah, 30 years ago, you know, Ray Bradbury or whatever, you know, projecting that we were going to be able to talk to one another and see each other on a communication device or on a, on your television screen. Yeah. Crazy, you know, and, yeah. and people are making, uh, you know, this because you're a recording producer and engineer, people are making records this way. You know, they, they'll record it at home and then yeah. fly it into you and then you put it in the computer and you mix and you send it and then the other guy does his vocals. I mean, it's it's a marvel what's going on technology wise. Yeah, it's pretty neat. I kind of say I'm I'm 50 50 on it. I really enjoy just working on my own and mm-hmm. getting tracks sent in. I can sit there and play with them and do what I need to do and wait for the next ones to come in. Um, but there is that part that you, you really miss of that interaction when that person's right across from you and you can, you know, this, and you know that too, it's, yeah, it's that, you know, spontaneous, you might hear them play a little something that you're like, Oh, wait, wait, you know, let's do that. And you don't always get that opportunity to do that if someone's kind of working at home on, on a project, but you get to understand real quick, who's good at that. Um, and who's not, cause not every musician is a producer um, no, and it's a no. different skill set um, being a studio musician, um, being able to lay it down and doing whatever. But that producer role sometimes always has to be there for, for certain people. Um, yeah. Not yeah. I miss, I miss the interaction in the studio live yeah. too. Uh, although I did a session last week with uh, there's a mural downtown that they painted on young street. It's like 22 stories high. And uh, on one side of the building is all the pioneers of the music business, Gordon Lightfoot, uh, um, Ronnie Hawkins, Glenn Gould, you know, all these people. And then on the other side of the building is the band and David Clayton Thomas and Rush. And for some reason, we got on there as well. Awesome. So uh, Kathy Young, who's uh, she's on the wall as well, uh, wrote a a cover of the old Beaumont song, uh, just wash your hands, wash your hands, you know? And mm. it was like George Oliver, yeah, yeah. legendary, yeah. John Finley from Rhinoceros and John and Lee and the Checkmates. And a bunch of us actually recorded this PSA and filmed it, but everybody was in masks and everybody was 10 feet away from each other. It was just so good to be in that environment again with other human beings, you know? Yeah. So I know exactly where you're coming from. Yeah. It's, It's an interesting spot where we are right now, too, because we're in this phase where everyone's just chomping at the bit to get going and see vaccines are coming. But yet we're not there yet. So it's 
it's uh, it's a tough place to be, right? You're just in this middle we're, land. We're a, year, we're a year off. Yeah, I agree with I'm you. I'm saying it's got to be a year. I, I've, I mean, first of all, I've got I've written these two things. That's awesome. I, I'm already working on the third book, uh, which I'm I'm calling uh, the Idiots Trilogy Part Four, <laughs> and uh, it's very funny. I mean, these books are these books were funny. Yeah, but but it's great because. Uh, they're exactly the same amount of pages, and I didn't intentionally do that. Yeah, I can see that. So, uh, and I realized when I came back from Calgary five years ago, I'd been in Calgary for eight years, I didn't write anything about my misadventures out there, all the trouble I caused in that province. And so I realized that basically I was writing a trilogy. And then I decided to call it the Idiots Trilogy Part 4. You know, and, and we'll get to all the, you know, the mayhem that we caused in, uh, in, in Calgary. So what are the books? Tell us about the books. Um, first book, first of all. Um, well, this one I wrote uh, first. Dave Bedini from the Rhea Statics was working on his first book called On a Cold Road. Uh, and by the way, Shop Greg Gonovitz, that's where you can find these things. Um he called me up and said, uh, I'm doing a book about road stories. Can I come and interview you? And I, I said, yeah, great. You know, love Dave. And then the book came out and uh, it was only a couple hundred pages long, but 22 pages in his book were my stories. Oh, yeah. And uh, Peter Goddard, uh, the writer for the Toronto Star at the time, I was one Saturday morning, I'm reading his review of the book. And he, he, was, he was quite, for a guy that's a harsh critic, he said, uh, he says, most of the stories are pretty mundane with the exception of this guy who should clearly write his own book. And I, I, I look at it, I thought, yeah, I mean, you know, 22 pages of the best stories in Dave's book were my stories. So I, I set about writing it that day. And it took me about, I think it was about 12, a year. Yeah. And, uh, I sent it to a, uh, an editor at a, at a book company and he says, have you ever read a book before? And I said, yes, <laughs> I'm a voracious reader. I read three books a week. He goes, you've sent me a 300 page paragraph. And I said, and I looked at it and it's true. It was, there was no, there was no breaks in it. It was oh, just, yeah. it, was, it was 300 pages of random thinking. You know, yeah. just, so then it took me another six months to separate it all. You know, uh, this book, I wanted to, I didn't want to do part two because this book goes from 1964 when I started mm -hmm. to uh, 1984 when Gatto first called it a day. Yeah. I've got a picture here. I'm just going to quickly, I should mark these things for when I do these. So it starts back this, if we can, I, I never anyway, get this yeah, right yeah, because yeah. it's backwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there's me at 13 years old with wow. the absolute perfect beetle haircut. No kidding which got me in a lot of trouble in high school because I was the first guy in my high school to look like this. Wow. But I also met Brian Pilling in my grade nine class who would end up becoming the great songwriter with his brother Ed of Flood, you know? Yeah. So when this book was finished and I started writing the second one, I wrote 150 pages, which was taking off from 1984. And then I, I said, this is boring, even though I spent a few months writing it. So I decided to go through my archives and I found all sorts of short stories and random thoughts and stuff. And I thought, I'm going to write a humor book. I mean, Travels With My Amp was funny. Everybody said, this is a funny book. Yeah. But it was inadvertently funny. I yeah. mean, <laughs> I'm not exactly known as a comedian, right? And, and then uh, when I wrote this one, this one's hilarious. And people are saying to me, like, whatever you do, don't read this in bed with your spouse at night because they'll smash it for laughing out loud, you know. <laughs> or, or the wife says, what is that idiot doing now, you know. Yeah. Uh, so this book took six years to write. Wow. Because uh, it's – being funny is one thing. Writing funny – Yeah. I mean, every time I see a crummy sitcom now, I go, I know how difficult this is <laughs> to write something that will make people laugh out loud, you know. And now I'm writing, uh, so far, the 100 pages I've written for the new book, Yeah, of course, is very pandemic heavy. Oh, yeah. But my gal hears me cackling away in the office, and she comes in and she says, what are you laughing at? And, and I, she reads it, and she goes, how can you find humor in what this nightmare that we're going through? 
Well, you know, that old adage, time plus tragedy equals comedy, right? Yep. So <laughs> That's true. I'm going to get away from those stories. I mean, I've got a lot more stories, of course, of what, like I said, about living in Calgary and the music scene out there. And then a bunch of other things that pop into my head, like I've got a story about, uh, I, I played in this club in Toronto with an all-star blues band on Tuesday nights. It was called Blues on Bel Air in Yorkville. Yep. And uh, the only night that I took off and took a night off, Prince shows up and jams with my band. No all. way. <laughs> and the guy, the, Jerome Godbu, the great harmonica player, it was him leading the band. That He calls me the next day. He goes, oh, Greg, you're not going to believe this, man. I said, what do you mean? Why didn't you phone me? He says, we took a night off. I said, dude, it was Prince, you no know? Kidding. And they told me that all night he just played with his left hand. He never touched the guitar with his right hand. Wow. He just played the whole night. And knowing me, I would have said, and probably got killed for it because they had all his bodyguards with him. I would have said, you know, this kid's pretty good. I said, can you imagine what he could do if he put both hands on the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> and I would have said it for sure, man. Yeah. So anyway, stories like that, we'll, we'll go into the next book. And then they're funny. You know, we'll let people have a laugh at my stupidity. You know? Well, writing books, I mean, that's not easy. It's a lot of time, a lot of work, as you said, the editing. And, and you know, it, it's a different set of skills for sure. It, it takes a lot of time. And, and Well, it's uh, like writing a 400-page song. Yeah. <laughs> You know, every time you, you write one page full of lyrics, multiply that by 400. And that's what writing a book is like, you know, you have to be, it has to have a hook and it has to be interesting and hopefully amusing so that people, you know, will go to shop Greg Gondovitz down there and buy that's it. Right. You know? yeah. Well, congratulations on those two books. That's, that's pretty awesome. And, the, and the I'm pr I never thought I'd ever be an author, but you yeah. know, it's, uh, I guess it was, I was talking to this phenomenal hero of mine I've got to know in New York named Richard X. Heyman. If you want to do yourself a favor and look up this guy's music. Now he's my age, but he, he he's a dead ringer for what Todd Rundgren looked like back in the mid sixties, you wow. know? Yeah. And he's one of the greatest pop uh, songwriters I've ever heard in my life. He played drums for a band called the Doughboys, which was mm -hmm. like a power pop band, yeah. but he plays every instrument and his wife engineers, and they make these absolutely brilliant pop albums. And he's actually read both of my books and he was talking, he says, he says, it's obvious that, you know, you know what you're doing as a musician. He says, but to have that extra gene where you can write prose and make it as good as your music, that's, and I don't know where it comes from. I mean, it's just, you know, the squishy stuff up in here. You know well, I mean, certain people just have the right personality to, to put that down. And uh, I, I've toured a lot with Red Green. Um, oh, nice. And yeah. uh, I mean, his books, are just unreal, right? I mean, it's just, yeah, he's very funny. Oh, I've seen him a few times. The he's very stuff funny. that comes out of his brain, you just have, <laughs> and it just never, ever shuts off. It's always on. Um, well, that, that's the problem is, is how to shut it off. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I've tried to explain to people, like when I write songs and stuff, I can see them in my mind's eye, like they're written on ticker tape. It's like I have Times Square inside my head yeah. and it's just a nonstop or, or the crawl underneath CNN. That's that's exactly what I see, and it drives me nuts because I have trouble uh, turning it off at nighttime. You know. Yeah, it's not easy. I have that too. I have this thing too where I'm just constantly. I mean, not now. I'm not doing it, but if I'm sitting around doing something, I'm constantly doing some form of rhythm, like some type of, you know, drum beat or you know something. It's slight. Um, yes. But you know, you might take it. You know, as a. I don't know, like a nervous little thing or something or cause I got, why are you doing that? And you know, even my family's like, what are you, I'm just, you got, you have a beat in your head and you just, you know, just kind of going along with it. Right. And that, that's one thing it just constantly I'm doing is sit in the car driving and always got my hands going on the steering wheel, doing a little rhythm. Yeah. And, um, it's just part of, you know, whatever is in you that needs to get out for some particular reason. So. Yes. Yeah, so it's nervous energy is what it is. Yeah. Like I'll be, I'm absolutely convinced that the songs, and I know there's a lot of songwriters feel the same way. We've got this antenna that's always up. We mm -hmm. can't see it, but I'll be driving in my car and it's like I drive through a song and all of a sudden I can see and know exactly what it is. I can see all the lyrics. It's like someone's sending them to you. Like at, at, the, at the back of this book, I wrote, I had some television scripts that I wrote you can't see those, but oh yeah, I see them now. Uh, 
for based on 1964 from this book. And part of the scenario uh, in the scripts is that John Lennon and Buddy Holly and Mozart are in this writing room up in heaven. There's, there's just clouds and there's a card table and then there's a, a filing cabinet. And Mozart is complaining that, you know, I wrote Herschel, you know, uh, in D major, all this stuff. And now I'm writing crummy rock and roll songs with these idiots. Right? <laughs> and then they throw them down like lightning bolts and guys like me go, oh, OK, I'll accept that. You know, yeah. I just wish that they'd give me better lyrics. You know, whoever's writing these songs, <laughs> if it's the aliens or whoever it is, I, I wish they'd give me some better lyrics, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back uh, a few years to when you, you got going in music. Uh, where where did you grow up, actually? Exactly where I am now, Scarborough, yeah. uh, East End. Yeah. Uh, you know, born and raised here, went to all the schools here. And still, when I returned from uh, Calgary, and hooked up with my wonderful gal, Mrs. Claypool. I can't remember her real name. Uh, it's not Mrs. Claypool, though. I know that. Yeah. Mrs. Mrs. is her first name, Mrs. Claypool. And uh, she grew up just up the street from where we're living now and went to the high school where I first saw Flood play. So it's like full circle, you yeah. know, coming back and, and living in the old neighborhood again. And I just love it. You know, uh, uh, we call ourselves Scarberians out yeah. here. <laughs> And I, I've always, even when I was in Calgary, I was still a Scarborough guy. You know? Yeah. So what what got you into music? What was the driving force to to get into that? Well, my brother, my older brothers were uh, into uh, the pioneers of rock and roll. They're they're a little bit older, so it was Elvis and Roy Orbison and yep. Major Lance and that. My uncle Raymond, who lived with us for a while, had all of the early sun 78s and i know this because one day of course i wasn't supposed to play with them and they were like big shellac 78s and of course i dropped a record and it just shattered yeah. and then tried to blame it on my sister uh but uncle raymond it knew it was me that did it mm -hmm. uh, those were those records are worth about twenty five thousand dollars each today right yeah. and i broke it um so uh i was i was in a house full of music you know my mom would listen to the she had all of her Perry Como and mm -hmm. Jackie Gleason presents albums, you know, yeah. music for lovers. Uh, and then my mom worked at the Friars Tavern as a coat mm -hmm. check girl. Yeah. So from the ages of 12 on, I would go down to the Saturday afternoon matinee where I would watch Levon and the Hawks play, yeah. who of course became the band. Yeah. And I'd sit with Rick Danko, who was a really good mentoring guy. Uh, he told me, he says, oh, no, no. I said, I want to be a drummer, you know. He says, no, you got bass player hands. And then he sells my mom a trainer amplifier with the serial number 0003. Wow. Which I wish I still had because okay. Pete Trainer built that one by hand. Yeah. And then, you know, I met David Clayton Thomas there. Mm -hmm. I met Ronnie Hawkins there. Uh, and then 40 odd years later, I'm Ronnie Hawkins band leader. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it was like it was ordained, you know. Yeah. But, but the pivotal moment was my brother, Gary, uh, who played tenor saxophone in high school. Uh, he brought home a copy of With the Beatles, Beatlemania. Yeah. And I remember looking at the front cover, uh, you know, where half of them is in silhouette and they've got the little beetle haircut, not even full beetle haircuts. And I remember looking at it and going, they look stupid, you know. And then my brother dropped the needle on the groove. It will be long. Yeah. Came on and my life changed instantly. I, mean, I, I said, that's what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And as it turns out, it looks like that's the way it's going. It's interesting with the Beatles, and you take a look how influential they were on just everybody's lives. Everybody. But I, You know, interviewing tons of people, it's pretty rare that the Beatles aren't mentioned as someone that was really <laughs> the influencing, you know, way of why they played an instrument. Even people who are... Uh, diehard country guys and bluegrass guys and yeah. it doesn't matter what style of music it was you go back it's like yeah it was the beatles um it, it's pretty you uh, Tom wonder Petty, bruce yeah. springsteen roger mcguinn all of them every one of them every one of those guys says if it wasn't for them there wouldn't be a them yeah. you know i mean and you know I, fortunately i i've been able to meet a number of people from that story including paul and ringo wow. 
And uh, I met George Martin and uh, Cynthia Lennon. I met a whole bunch of the people that were ancillary figures, but famous in their own right yeah. over the years. Um, Steve Lukather, as I told you before, is a great friend of mine. And of course, he plays with Ringo's All-Star Band. Yeah. yeah. So he calls me up and he says, uh, we're rehearsing up at Casino Rama. Do you want to come up and hang? <laughs> Let me just check. Yeah, okay. You know, so like before he hung up the phone, I was already there. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I'm having dinner with him and Todd Rundgren and these guys. And Luke says, this is my friend Gatto. You don't know him. He's one of us. He just didn't get that little extra push that we got. So, you know, I mean, all of a sudden I'm in the boys club having one-on-ones with those guys. That's and awesome. the last night before the show starts, Luke says to me, so you haven't asked yet. He says, do you want to meet the boss? And I went, Springsteen's here? And he goes, he says, no, that's what we call Ringo. I said, oh, that's okay. I've already met Bruce. So, it's, you know, and the next night he, he says, meet me at the dressing room door and a, an aide will come and get you in. And the guy comes up to me and he says, I took Joe Rockman from Jeff Healy's band because he's a friend of Luke too. Yeah. And uh, the, guy, the guy says, no autographs, no photographs. I said, that's not necessary. I just want to shake the guy's hand. He goes, that's not going to happen. He says he only bumps forearms. Oh, yeah. And right at that moment, the door open, opens and Ringo comes in. He goes, I don't shake hands. I just bump forearms. I said, that's exactly <laughs> what that guy said you were going to do. <laughs> and, and Ringo starts laughing, right? So Luke has got this look of sort of terror, knowing how, what I'm like. Because yeah. when I first met him at Jeff Healy's club, we were talking about the blues. And I said, oh, yeah, nothing says the blues like Toto. You know? so, <laughs> and he goes, yeah, that's not fair. You know? And we become best friends, right? Yeah. But that's, that's my humor is to just blurt out whatever the hell comes in. So I said to Ringo, I said, you know, you, you've been rehearsing. I've been here all week. The, I said, you look fantastic. Um, uh, you're singing great. I said, it's too bad you couldn't get anybody good in your band, you know? <laughs> and, and, oh, see, he, he looks at Luke and he bursts out laughing, right? And then Ringo says, do you want to have a picture taken? Oh, so he yeah. asked us. Yeah. And it, it was great, you know? And, and afterwards, when we left, Joe Rockman was staring at me and, and I said, what's up? And he goes, how do you do that? I said, do what? He says, he says, and this is his words. He says, you were so cool in front of that guy. And it's a bloody beetle. I said, you know what? They don't want to hear about that. No. They, they want to hear about, when I met McCartney, you know what we talked about? We talked about baseball. Yeah. And he spent a half an hour with me because I wasn't going, oh, you know, just like, like everybody else in the room. We talked about baseball. And, and I'd like to think I put the germ in his head because the next thing, he says, I've never been to a game, you know. And, and the next thing I know, there he is going to New York Yankees games. Wow. So I like to think I put that little yeah. bug in his head, you know? Well, that's true. I mean, all those guys, it's the same questions, the same reactions, same everything. Yeah. They just want to have fun and feel comfortable that they're around somebody. And that's that's the ticket always is, is not worrying about – you know what was it like playing this show or you know yeah and they don't they, they don't, don't want to hear care. that they were yeah. there <laughs> yeah they just want you know my, my friends that know that eddie kramer and for people that don't know this sounds like the biggest name drop in the world but this is my life uh eddie kramer and i were working on the restoration of the alma combo that's where i met him he was building an electric lady north studio there yep. with john story and we both left the project around, around the same time for various reasons it'll it'll come in the next book uh, but we became friends, you know, to the point where we go on vacations together. And my friends go, you must pick his head, like, like ask him, you know, you got, you're with him. I said, we don't, we don't do that. They said, well, what do you talk about? I said, Eddie, you're putting too much garlic in the sauce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talk about normal things, right? Yeah. Uh, a friend of mine, his daughter is married to one of the Foo Fighters. And we, I've known her since she was in diapers. So she's just like another daughter to me. But we go up there and, and Pat is at the cottage and stuff. But to tell you the truth, I can't even name you one of their songs. So he's he's safe around me because I, I'm not, you know, ooh, can I have your autograph? I mean, I don't care. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, I say to him, hey, you're putting too much garlic in the sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny when you meet someone that's not, you know who they are and you respect what they do, but you may not know their music. And it's a different conversation because you don't totally you don't have that knowledge that you would have with some other people. So you just talk about other stuff that 
is important yeah. to you, right? Well, well, that's it, normal. Normal. You know I mean, because exactly. everybody, you know, no matter who's in your house, they always ask where the washroom is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? My daughter, uh, her boyfriend uh, is Drake's partner. Okay. So, I mean, they travel in rarefied air. Yeah. But once again, I mean, when I talk to her boyfriend, who's, who's a songwriter, who writes lyrics and stuff for Drake, uh, I couldn't name you one of his songs. He's the biggest, he's bigger than the Beatles, for God's sake. And I can't, I can't even, you know, what? Yeah. Oh, exactly. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> well, I mean, you just come to a certain time in your life where you just don't follow music. You know who those people are, but you listen to music to a certain age. I've, I've mentioned this on the podcast before. I think it's up to like, they've said till you're, you're in your mid thirties or so. That's where you stop listening to new music, new music for most people. And yeah. I, I would be the exception. I mean, I still see, hear music coming up and I go, that's phenomenal. Yeah. You know, like a Canadian bands like the Perpetrators out of Winnipeg are phenomenal. Uh, you know, Greg Wired, an English guy that lives in Toronto now, uh, phenomenal songwriters. But I know what you mean. I mean, the fact that I can't name a Drake song, <laughs> the biggest guy on the planet, or a Foo Fighters song that sell out stadiums uh, shows that I'm, you know, marginally out of the loop. But we we recently, on this very computer that we're, we're on right now, we downloaded 2,000 CDs into it that all went into sub-genres, you know. So the, the, the CD player knows that Frank Sinatra goes in the same pocket as Tony Bennett. Yeah. And that... The only mistake they made is all the albums of Gregorian chants that I happen to have for some reason <laughs> went into the same pocket as my Ravi Shankar music. So Sunday morning, you'll hear this beautiful raga, and the next thing is, Dominista Mori. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, computer, get with it. Hey, so we're still, we're still massive. Uh, both Mrs. Claypool and myself are massive music fans. You know, I mean, she worked for Westbury Show Systems for 36 years. And had worked with Elton John and those, the bigs, you know? Yeah. yeah. So. So let's sit back again. Um, which <laughs> Am is, I digressing? No, it's great. Uh, learning an instrument. So did you end up playing bass first? Was that your, your thing you went to? I did. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, Rick Danko sold my mom, the trainer. Mm -hmm. We called it a piggyback because it was a bass master head, yeah. serial number three and then a 15 inch cabinet. And my dad brought me home. Now in my book, I described it as a Supro three quarter scale. That bass left me 50 odd years ago. And I, I went on to get, I think it was like a, you couldn't get a Hofner. So I got a, an Echo Italian violin shaped bass. That's the only one you could find back then. Yeah. I went to that. And the bass disappeared. And then one day I got a call from a music store in Toronto saying, we've got something here that you might be interested in. And I walked into the store and went, that's my first bass guitar. And they said, we had a feeling it was. Wow. And it wasn't three-quarter scale. It was a, a Supro pocket bass. So it, it's like a toy. It's yeah. like this big. You know, I couldn't play it back then because I couldn't play. But I had the right hairdo. Yeah. And I had an amp. So they got me into a band so that everybody else could plug their stuff. We had the microphone going in there. Oh, yeah. uh, it was like a one 10 inch speaker. We had the guitar going through it. We had the mic that was on the stand up piano going through it. The only thing that didn't go through it was my bass because I couldn't really play. Yeah. But I could sing and I had a Beatle haircut and a Beatle jacket. So I was in, you know. Perfect. <laughs> uh, and I got the bass back. Now, my dad bought it for 50 bucks from somewhere. And uh, I don't know even where it went, but it ended up in Quebec and it had this circuitous route around the country before it ended up back in Toronto. And I recognized it instantly because there was a, a marking on it that I'd done, you know, that I'd stupidly made. And it cost me a thousand bucks to get it back, but I've got my original first bass guitar back. Yeah. It, well, it's priceless really when it comes down to it. It's, uh... it's it'll go, they're, they're gonna have a, a Toronto, we're, there's a bunch of us that are organizing a Toronto music museum. Oh, nice. Good idea. Just, just Toronto. Yeah. We, I've been to the national museum, uh, national uh, uh, music center in Calgary. It's fantastic, yeah. but there's a lot of things uh, missing in it, you know? So I said, Let, let's just do a Toronto centric one, but cover Glenn Gould and Gordon Lightfoot and all the guys that played, 
you know, the clubs in Toronto did concerts here and stuff. Yeah. And that's what we're going to do. So that, that's where it'll end up eventually is in that place. You know? Yeah. Good, good idea. So they'll be putting me into a museum shortly. <laughs> when I die, I want them to stuff me and put me on young street. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny the other day, I think it was the last weekend. Um, I just went for a drive. I said, I just, I, you know, I live in the country and I've been kind of staying, you know, close and that's pretty, pretty much. And I, said, I just, I got to drive to Toronto. So I just drove up and took a drive down young street and, and uh, it was quiet. I think it was a Sunday morning and I, but it was just like, I just got to get to the city <laughs> to see what it did looks, you, see what it looks did like. Did you happen to see the the mural? I no? didn't. No, I missed it. I mean, I was driving and, you know, traffic, there are people, you know, give me, give me one second. No. Amuse the customers while I go get a prop and show you something because it's okay. pretty amazing what I'm going to show you. So this, what I've got here, is a reproduction of what the mural looks like on the side of the street that I'm on. And I'll go through it, but this is what it looks like. Oh, neat. Wow. So at the top, we've got, let me get this in here. Yeah. We've got the band at yeah. the top. And there's David Clayton Thomas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lonnie Johnson, who's an American that lived and played the blues here. Uh, Jay Douglas, R&B singer. And then those guys over there would be Gatto flying through the air oh. over the Gasworks logo. Yeah. Uh, Salome Bay, Rush. Nice. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie oh, yeah, played yeah. a lot down there. Yeah. Uh, Kim Mitchell, of course, Carol Pope, yeah. John and Lee and the Checkmates, Kathy Young yeah. and the Mandela. Wow. Now what, they did the other one. They had Glenn Gould and Jackie, little Jackie Shane, the first transgender artist in Canada yeah. ever anywhere. Wow. And um, they had all those pioneers of music. I, I think Muddy Waters and BB King played a lot on young street. They're on the other side of the building. So they phoned me up and they said, we're painting the other side this year. And we wanted to know if it's okay if we could, you know, paint you 20 feet high on a building for the rest of time. And I went, let me see. Yes, <laughs> it would be fabulous. Okay. Who else is on it? They said, well, these guys are on it and Rush is on it. And I said, hang on, hang on, hang on. I said, how many stories is, is this building? And he says, it's 22 stories. I said, you're trying to tell me. You're going to get my nose and Getty Lee's nose on a building that's only 22 stories high. And he says, we'll, we'll put you on a balcony. <laughs> so, so anyway, this is this is at Young and uh, Girard, okay. just no north of Girard. It's on the east side of the street. I mean, if you're driving, you can't miss it either way because it, all of a sudden you go, holy smokes, what the hell is that? Yeah. You know? And it was this one guy, Adrian uh, Hales, the artist. I would go down there and he would be on a, a scaffold by himself up there lis listening to whatever artist he was uh, painting. Like he'd be listening to Rush songs and then painting them, you wow. know, or, or I got a film of him listening to one of my songs. So I think under my hat or pretty bad boy and, and painting us. And, and I occasionally I would give him money for lunch. So he gave me way more hair than I ever actually had, which <laughs> <laughs> it, it really paid to grease the guy. You know, he gave me way oh, more yeah. hair than I ever owned. That's awesome. It's, well, that's, it's that's that story. I'm just going to move this over here. You bet. It's interesting when you see uh, people who can do that type of art, right? And oh, it's incredible. Because it's so far from what I can do. But then they can look at what we do or what you do, and they're fascinated by that. Um, well, totally. It, it's, it's, I, I can't draw anything. I do, I do stick people. Yeah, you know? I'm the same way. But but they have fabulous cartoon bubbles. <laughs> yeah. It's it's like stick people, but they're really smart and yeah. funny. You know, so I, and I got a lot of friends that are actually artists and they said, well, get a canvas and there's your style. Do really smart stick people, right? <laughs> Having arguments about religion and politics and stuff. right? <laughs> but yeah, so th that gene I did not get, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. be being able to draw anything, but you know, I, I can write the odd song. My as, Eddie Kramer, as Eddie Kramer said yeah. to me, he says, you've written a few hundred songs, a couple of which are actually quite good. <laughs> <laughs> so what would you say your, if you had to say your best skill, um, what would you want to say you want to be known as this or are you most proud of doing this? What would it be? I'm just getting started, man. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go next. You know, I, I, I am going to write not, I have to finish the new book first, 
But uh, I started a children's book years ago based on my my daughter's teddy bear. Yeah. She called. She, she came to me one day. She had a handful of coffee beans, and she goes, "This is Choby. This is Phoebe." And, and Choby ended up becoming the name of this teddy bear. And I, I would hold it and I go, "Choby, do you like Daddy?" And he would, <laughs> "Do you like Jasmine?" And he would go, "No." <laughs> So I came up with a story called uh, Choby, the little bear that couldn't talk, but he could do everything else. So he could fly and he's got superpowers and he finds a stick that can talk like a walking stick. In the, in the. So I'm going to finish that book. That'd be great. But what I really want to do is I want to write a stage play uh, called musical. Yeah. And, and I've had the whole idea in my head for many years uh, where, where the play would happen from stage left and then there, and then the middle of the thing. And and it would be this van moving across to like the, the the band at the truck stop where the fight breaks out. And then they arrive at the next gig and they're unloading and it, it, it's going to be called the van. Yeah. And the, the prop would be a Econoline van that's cut in half and the band loads up and gets into it. And then all of a sudden the side comes up and then you can see them while they're driving to the next gig and all those things that happen on the road and you've been there, you know, oh, yeah. you know, in the van, the gig you know, is only part of it. <laughs> the gig is only part of it. So, you know, it, it would start out with the band coming off stage at a club. And of course the guys are all pissed off because the singer was doing this, that. And of course he comes in with a chick and the big fight breaks out and then they get into the loading the equipment and, you know, what happens when you're in the van and everybody's mad, but then everything lightens up and somebody farts and, you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> all hell breaks loose. We've all been there. And I think it would, it would be a stage play with music uh, that that rock and roll people would enjoy. So, like I said, I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, even at, at my age now, you know, having just turned 70, I don't see any end in sight until I just, like, drop one of these days, right? Well, that's awesome. I mean, I think a lot of us who are – entertainers or musicians or people who like to express themselves a certain way and and whatever that is that we have it, it's it just doesn't shut off like we've no. mentioned before you just can't say all right that's that's it you might end up not playing as much or singing as much or or writing or whatever you you're doing but there is also this avenue that you'll spin to that is completely related and that keeps you going another right. section, yeah. right? And it's all, it's all tied together and you'll just find that new thing, right? It's just, it's always, it's interesting in your life. And when you're young, you think, okay, I'm going to be this for the rest of my life. But all of a sudden this opportunity comes around over here and, oh, that's kind of neat. And I think yeah. what's neat about people who are in the music industry, you're, you're excited about a lot of different things and, and it's it's easy to just kind of jump from here to there because it just whatever makes you excited about what you're doing is is very important. This is why I still idolize Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. I mean, that guy's never going to stop. No, you know he's almost eighty years old. He's got like two albums a year come out. He writes classical music and oratorios. He writes children's books. I mean, a Renaissance man yeah. is what he is. And, and and sure, he gets diminishing returns because. The, I remember I had uh, one of the Hudson brothers who was working with Ringo producing him. And he was telling me a story about uh, McCartney coming in to lay a track down. And he was playing in the wrong key. And I said, did you tell him? He goes, you're going to tell Paul McCartney? He's not, you're the producer. Of course, that's what you do. Yeah. That's what those guys, I would love to produce Paul McCartney because I wouldn't be afraid to say, you're playing in the wrong key, yeah. you know? That's the wrong chord. And, and because those guys have had people kissing their bums for so long yeah. that they don't realize when they've made something that's not quite up to their, their level, you know? That's why when, when I did my solo album, which looks like, hang on, I got it here somewhere. I did this album in Calgary, Amuse Me, uh, with Paul Dean from Loverboy. Yeah. So the guitar no, player, not Paul well. Dean, <laughs> the, that Paul Dean, yeah. No, not. And, I was going to say Paul, not Paula Dean, the the cook from the south. No, no, <laughs> the, the <laughs> Paul <laughs> Dean, the professor. But you know, the engineer said to me, Paul insisted that he gets production credit. Done, 
You know, I got this guy that sold 50 million records. I sold zero million records. You're the producer. <laughs> so yeah, you, you got the job. But the engineer said to me, doesn't it bother you that 80% of these ideas are yours? And I said, no, because the 20% of ideas that Paul came up with were way better than the 80% of the ideas I had. So I produced, starring, guitar playing, arrangements, Paul Dean. I got no problem with that at all. The end result was it's the best record I ever made. That's great. Thanks to him, you know. Yeah, as a producer, it's not always you have to be hands-on and telling everybody exactly what to play from beginning to end. You're just kind of most of the time there to manage the situation. Yeah, And that's make right. sure it all goes smooth. Um, and if you're using the right players and the right combination and the team is good, lots of times you don't have a whole lot to say because it's, yeah. it's being done. But it's just molding that together. And part of it is putting the team together make sure you have the right guys and and make sure the songs are in a good place to start or and then that little extra sauce on the top that last 20 percent um or just having someone different than your yourself yeah. and listening to it is, you can't think of everything no no yeah uh, we we had because i'd been there for a couple of years uh and paul and i when i realized paul was living there we would hang out and then I, I finally got him. He never left his house. And his wife was so happy I was there because Sunday nights we would go and host a jam session at this little blues club. And he'd be hiding in the back. But everybody knew it was Paul Dean, you know, so they all wanted to come and sit in with us. Yeah. And that's how we were basically auditioning guys to record with because we'd have this. The one kid was great. Uh, he only played on a couple of tracks. I don't know why I didn't use him on the whole album. 20 year old kid. And I, I, the kid's playing with us. And I look at Paul and Paul goes, oh, yeah, for sure, this guy. So I said to him, I said, have you ever been in a studio? He said, no. I said, well, you're, you're about to work with the big boys, man. And we got him in and the kid was phenomenal. I mean, he, yeah. great chops. I, 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 I'm kicking myself that I didn't get him to play the whole album. But we had three different bass players. Of course, you know, that's my main instrument. Yeah. And all three bass players said to me, how come you're not playing bass on this? I said, I've heard me. I'm tired of me. I want to hear what you do. Yeah. And the bass playing is great. Until I had to learn how to play these songs and sing them at the same time. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, with Gatto, I, I could just pump eights all night. Boom, 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 you know, and sing piece of cake. All of a sudden it's boom, 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 boom. And I have to sing over that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was cursing these guys when I was putting my new band together. <laughs> was, and that, yeah, because you... You learn to copy their riffs. Yeah. And that's the tough thing to do. You can always play and predict yourself forever. Um, I could I could probably listen to something I played on 20 years ago and listen halfway through it and know exactly what I'm, what I'm going to what's going to come next, because it's just your it just comes naturally out of you. But lifting what someone else does yeah. is, you know, little inflections and then try to sing on top of it. Um, well, everybody's always said that playing bass and singing is almost impossible because your mind's doing two different things. Yeah. But, you know, when I first learned how to play, I saw her stand in there. But doo -doo 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 -doo. I was 13 years old and could sing it because we go, well, he's doing it. <laughs> you just don't realize that, yeah, to play a walking bass line that involved. And well, she was just 17 and you put do, 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 do. But it, we just did it. Yeah. And then somebody pointed out later, that's really hard what you're doing. No, it's not. I mean, he's doing it. <laughs> there he is on Ed Sullivan doing it. I mean, why can't I do it? You know, but we didn't think like that because no. we weren't really thinking back then, you know? Yeah. You just did it. So out of all the people you've met, um, and you know, you obviously we've talked about you're very comfortable meeting famous people, but did you have that one person when once they finally left that was like, Wow, I can't I can't believe that that just happened. Well, all of them, all of them. really. Yeah. It's it's just that you know, I mean, when I had my radio show, uh I would say to the guests, listen, you know, we're having a dinner party. Do you want to come? So, you know, I've got Pete Best. And his brother, Rogue, who was uh, Neil Aspinall's son, yeah. at my dinner table, you know. 
and uh, Danny Doherty, you know, Monday, Monday and California dreaming. We're playing and singing together. And then when they leave, you go, I just had an actual beetle having dinner with me in my house, you know? Yeah. But while the, at the same time, I have a massive collection of Beatles memorabilia and the whole basement was like a museum, but I didn't take Pete down to look at it because he was in town to do a Beatles conference. And I knew he was going to get three days of Beatle, 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 Beatle. Yeah. So when the promoter called me up and said, I got a couple of people that are in town. They need a safe house for the nice, can they come over to your place? I said, yeah, sure. So I told my dinner guests, I said, look, there's a couple of people coming over that you're going to recognize. <laughs> and let's stay off the subject of what they do for a living tonight. So they, they never even saw the Beatles collection. Wow. And Pete ended up falling asleep on my couch with a beer in his head. And I went, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, and that happened a lot, you know, yeah. but like, like we said earlier, it, it, and, and even with the limited, limited amount of notoriety and fame that I've got, I can see when people come up at the end of the concert, how nervous they are. And, and I, I'll go way out of my way to make, Hey, it's okay. You know, let's, let's just talk, you know, because I've, I've been with the best. I mean, you know, you get a couple of Beatles, they know that routine. It's now Lennon, not so much, <laughs> but, yeah. but Paul, certainly Paul and Ringo were, you know, the affable guys, you know, and, uh, and it was a great lesson to learn is, is to respect the people that respect you, you know? Exactly. Yeah, that's for sure. So how have you found, uh, this last year with with everyone going through COVID and, you know, music industry having such a, a difficult time and, you know, difficult time starting up. Um, obviously, you've been able to work on, on your book and that type of thing, but do you miss getting out there and playing and seeing music and, and how has it affected your everyday? It, it hasn't really affected me too much because, I mean, I was winding down Gatto anyway. I wanted to do, I was tired of playing the same 20 songs for the last 40 years. Uh, and, you know, I've got, I've got, like I mentioned earlier, I've got, I've written about 300 songs. I'd like to play some of them, you know? Yeah. But then I, I developed this uh, little problem uh, in my hand and until I get an operation, I can't really play anyway. So it, it didn't, it didn't really affect me too much. And, and not only that, I've been doing it since I was 13 years old. So that's 57 years in the same job, you know, so take a year off. Okay. And there was enough stuff to do, uh, you know, to, to keep busy doing things. Uh, I have to admit it. some, I, I was thinking of, you know, building a, another wall in my house. So I had a different one to crawl up. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have a lovely place, you know, we're sitting, I'm sitting in the dining room and this place is like a museum here. You can sort of see from the back of this monstrous thing here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we, we had collect artwork and stuff in every room. I got my Beatles room downstairs with all my instruments in it. And, you know, uh, the family room has got all this, you know, family stuff. Every room is different. The kitchen is a laugh riot of color and artwork, but it, you know, I talked to guys, my friends who are like big rock stars and it doesn't matter how much, you know, you got or where you're living, you're still under house arrest for a year. Yeah. You know, uh, Elton John's husband, David, is a, a Gatto fan. Oh, cool. And I, I talk to, to John, his brother, all the time. Yeah. And they're going through it. I mean, you know, you know, when you're talking Elton John and you've got a house that looks like the Palace of Versailles, but he wants to go out and play, yeah. you know, and he can. And he's bloody Elton John and he's stuck at home. Paul McCartney's stuck at home, you know. Yeah. Yeah, and they're probably going to be the last ones to get going. Um, the really if they get going again. Yeah, McC McCartney's already hinted at the fact that that he's pretty sure that that's it. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, in a couple of years, he's going to be eighty. Yeah, and, and you know, his voice is going a bit. I mean, why wouldn't it? I mean, the guy's been screaming. He still plays in the original keys, for God's sake. You yes. know. Yeah, and he's not nineteen anymore. You know, so. And then people are criticizing. Oh, give me a break. Let's see. You couldn't do that when you're 20, let alone when you're 78. <laughs> you know? Yeah. They they don't realize how long he's been doing that. And like you said, screaming for forever. Um, forever. And, you and three hour shows. Yeah. Same with Elton. We, we saw Elton uh, 
his last show here uh, just before COVID hit. And it was almost a three hour show. And he was phenomenal. And we were supposed to meet him that night, but uh, unfortunately David and John's mother passed away that night. Uh So we were at the restaurant, we had our passes, Elton's office, Rocket Entertainment got us the tickets in London. And I was like, wow, this is great. You know, I'm going to say hello to David and meet his husband and happens to be Elton John. Wow. You know, but then nothing happened because uh, their mom passed away, you know, but they're coming back next year, February, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, He's shopping to get back out there and and work, you know, the scary thing. And I've, I've been saying a lot is it's difficult when everything starts again, because everyone's at the starting gate at the same time. Like everyone wants to get going. And we all know we all spread our tours out over a year or two years or whatever ends up being. Everyone, you know, this person's out and they all kind of get spread out and there's usually room for everybody. But when we all starting at the same time uh, yeah. and all want to get going, it's going to be a disaster for half of them at least. Uh, just not going to be enough people to go out to see that many shows. Uh, enough people feeling comfortable to go see that many shows or can afford to it. So not only have you got your butt kicked for the last couple of years in the in industry, you're going to go back out and some of them are going to really fail just because it's really hard to compete against everybody, right? Um, it's it's a tough, tough thing to just restart. Um, and that, that's why I've had this conversation with umpteen friends of mine. Yeah. And I said, you know, God bless you. I love what you do, but I ain't coming to no club to see you again. Yeah. And, and I, I'm a baseball junkie, man, but am I going to go to see a Jays game? Not going to happen. Yeah. Because you don't know if the guy next door to you, you know, followed the same regimen, you know, distancing and mask wearing and all that stuff that you did. I mean, we're really cognizant of it, you know. Yeah. But, I mean, we, when uh, the first lockdown ended, we went to a movie theater to see a movie. I was I love going to the movies. And of course, there's like, you could shoot, shoot a cannon off in the Cineplex uh, place with like 20 theaters. There was nobody in it. Yeah. There was like a couple of girls taking the tickets and one guy behind the popcorn machine. That was it. And we had four, five people in the whole theater that we were in. And all of a sudden I could hear this sound. And it's this guy down front having an argument on his phone while the movie's on. <laughs> And I went down and I said, hey, come on, man, take it outside. I mean, we didn't pay to come here after three months of lockdown to listen to you argue with someone. Yeah. So then he goes into the tunnel. Oh, yeah. Instead, Now it's twice as loud yeah. and he's screaming. So then I go down and I said, okay, now you got to leave. And he's, he's like this. I said, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> I mean, are you kidding me? You're threatening me now? I said, just go outside in the hallway and have your bloody conversation. You know, I mean, ridiculous. And it just spoiled. And I, th- I thought, as long as there's idiots like this guy around, none of us are safe. You know, now, having said that, he's ended up in my new book. He doesn't come across very well, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. And now he knows. <laughs> he's now the butt, of, the butt of one of my jokes. So, you know, but it, I mean. And I'll see guys when I'm out, uh, you know, I go to the post office three times a week because I'm, I'm, you know, people that go to shop Greg Godovitz and buy these books and stuff. Uh, I'm in the post office. But it's incredible that you turn around and there's some guy there that looks like he, he's, he's in central casting for Vikings and he has no mask on. Yeah. And, and I, I looked at the guy behind me. I said, can you believe this idiot? And he goes, don't. He says, this guy's a killer, man. Don't let him hear you say that. Yeah. So you run the risk of going out there. And somebody will beat the hell out of you because you're telling them, well, where's your mask? You know? Yeah, I know. It's horrible horrible what we're going through. Yeah. It's everything. Everyone's super sensitive and um, super scared. Tempers are short. Yeah. Very. Um, Like you you don't go, you don't drive by anybody anymore and, and give them the finger because there's a good chance they'll shoot you. Yeah. Or run you off the road or wait for you and be, I mean, now, and I, I usually have people giving me the finger because I am the only guy that admits what a terrible driver I am. <laughs> You'll never meet another guy that will admit that, but I, I, am, I am the world's worst driver. <laughs> so I'm, I'm used to people giving me the finger when they drive by me or honking. Be like a, a typical Canadian, sorry, 
Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's like if somebody crashes into me, I just wave at them. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't care. That's awesome. I don't want to get into a confrontation just because you crashed into my car. <laughs> cool. Well, let's wrap up with a, a couple of questions I'd like to <laughs> ask a, a bunch of people I have on the podcast. And one of the questions I love asking, um, obviously, you've played a lot of places uh, with Gatto and, and in, over your career. Do you have a venue or place out there that you never played in but always wanted to play? Um, I haven't, I've never played Roy Thompson Hall. Oh, cool. That's, 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 that would be a bucket list one. Cause I've done Maple Leaf Gardens a couple of times and I've done the O'Keefe Center. Yeah. Uh, even the Rogers Center, I played there with Ronnie Hawkins. And of course, every club, but I, I've been to many concerts at Roy Thompson. And uh, I mean, it just sounds so good in that room. You it know? does, yeah. But I have to admit, I hope I get another shot at playing Massey Hall again. Cause I, I've done Massey Hall about six times in my life. And it's, it's our grand old Opry. I yeah. mean, it's, and now that they're refurbishing it and stuff, Lord knows how incredible it's going to be. Yeah, I'm anxious but, to see what happens there. And uh, it should be, I mean, it's such an iconic place to play and um, saw some great shows there. But, um, oh, you know, the it, best. It, yeah. <laughs> the best acoustics of any room ever. You yeah. Know? And it's, it's weird because uh, I was with my friend Mark Garner that did the murals. He's the guy that organized the murals. We went to see John Cleese at Roy Thompson, oh, of all places. And uh, Dean Cameron was there, mm-hmm. who, of course, was the president of the record company and then yep. also the head of Massey Hall. And he said, Greg, would you and Mark like to come for a tour of see what we're doing? Yeah. And he bloody died the next day. Oh, gosh. It was like such an incredible shock and loss to the music community. He was full of life mm-hmm. and excited about what was going on. And the next day he died. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know, so, I know you went quick. I mean, you just, you have to, you have to stay focused and always tell everybody you love them because you never know, you know? Yeah, for sure. Uh, another question I like to ask, obviously when you're touring and I know if when I'm touring, the next important thing uh, besides where you're playing in the show is where you're going to eat afterwards. Um, it's for me anyways. <laughs> yeah. Do you have a, a favorite restaurant of, of your, all your tours that you can you can point out saying, yeah, this is the place I you know can't wait to get back to at some point? There are so many of them. Uh, anybody that follows what we do on Facebook, the first the first month of the first lockdown, I went around with a guitar to all the famous places in Scarborough that were music related. And then restaurants to try and get them. I'd sing little songs and stuff, yeah. and give them some history of it. Nice. So my gal is a food food holic as well, and she compiled like six hundred places in Scarborough where you could get a great meal of any ethnic variety. Wow. But my favorite restaurant, which I actually went to on Saturday, my daughter took me for my birthday because we've had so many family wakes and weddings and birthdays there. Uh, it's called Casa Verde out in Pickering uh, Village. Uh, it's Southern uh, uh, Italian food. Nice. I don't even order in there anymore. It's yeah. just They're Roberto great. just keeps it coming. until so I'm actually going to gonna get a little white flag thing made that I can bring there and <laughs> surrender it when I'm finished. You know? But, I mean, I've always, it, back in the Gatto days especially, I mean, we ate in really, really top-notch restaurants yeah. everywhere across the country. There's so many of them. I uh, know. There's Oliver's st- in Winnipeg springs to mind. It's an old school, you know, would you like some cheese garlic bread with that? You know, one yeah, of those yeah. places, you know. There's so many great restaurants out there. Uh, Orestes, a uh, Greek restaurant in uh, Vancouver, where we went after a concert one night and we're so out of it, we ended up, our crew and the band and the record company guys in a huge barroom brawl in this guy's restaurant. I, I got punched in the face about 20 times before they threw me out. And a, a couple of years ago, I'm, I'm at Eddie and AJ's place and they said, Oh, you'd, you'd like this uh, store down. They, they sell Moroccan tapestries and stuff, stuff you like. So I go in and I'm talking to this old Greek guy. And he shows me this book he's written. And I see Orestes in it. I went, you're not the guy from Orestes restaurant in Vancouver, are you? And he goes, yes. He says, do you remember the night the rock band? He goes, I will kill you with a knife. 
you 50 years I'm in business and you come in and ruin my business. I'm going to kill you. I had to run out of the guy's store. Right? <laughs> that story's going in the new book, but we yeah. embellished, of course, you know? Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Anyway, I used to, a year after that, I took the mother of my children to Vancouver. We were playing the Commodore Ballroom. Yep. And I'd completely forgotten about what had happened the year before. So I take her after the show to Arrestes. And all of a sudden, I've got three waiters going, you have to leave here now. Yeah. And then I went, oh, yeah, this is the place where we had that big fight. I said, oh, okay. And she, we get out in the street and she goes, what the hell was that all about? Because, <laughs> of course, you know, I didn't come home and say, hey, you wouldn't believe this, you know, but we got into a really big fight because of my big mouth in this restaurant. You know? yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's all grist, all grist for the mill, you know. That's right. You don't want me eating in your restaurant, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> So what's the best way for uh, folks to keep in touch with you or see what you've been doing? Facebook, obviously. Um, yeah, Facebook. Uh, I don't have any more room. Apparently, Mark Zuckerberg, let you, they run out of cyber paper at 5,000 friends. Yes. Well, I, I joined Facebook so early that my first friend was Mark Zuckerberg. And I went, who the hell is this nerd? <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't know who he was. But he, when, they back used, yeah, in the used first friend, couple yeah. of he was your first friend. You yeah, know? yeah, I remember that. And uh, <laughs> and then on it goes from there. Occasionally, I'll go in and make like I'm Zeus, and I just send random people into cyberspace so I can let some somebody else on. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I check and see have they bought anything from Shop Grey Goddards? No, out you go. <laughs> you know, we'll get somebody in who's interested in buying something. Uh, but like I told you earlier, I, I'm going to do what you're doing, and uh, in late April have uh, a Rock Talk, which was the name of my radio show. Uh, Greg Otovitz Rock Talk podcast. Awesome. And I, I do have a YouTube channel yep. that we're going to start really updating. And of course, the Rock Talk podcast will be on the Greg Otovitz YouTube channel. Excellent. Uh, and there's there's a lot of interesting stuff on there. Oh, yeah. uh, you as an engineer, uh, Eddie Kramer uh, remixed the first Gato album from scratch. Oh, no way. So we have Under My Hat with the Eddie mix is on the YouTube channel. Wow. But you got to wear headphones because, of course, with Eddie, it's all panning and psychedelic, yeah. and you know. I use some and, of Eddie's plugins, so. Oh well, yeah, I'll tell him that. Yeah. yeah, he'll he'll be watching this on. Yeah. Uh, hello, Edwin. Yeah, uh, he'll be watching this on Friday. Awesome. Well, thanks uh, for being a guest on the podcast, and uh, my pleasure, man. We'd like to have you back and and do part two at some point. I know there's. There's a lot more we could probably go. Yeah, multi-series. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I had some of these that were scheduled for 15 minutes that all turned into two hours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and the host didn't get to say anything. <laughs> so <it's, laughs> That's perfect. You're lucky. At least I let you talk. You know? <laughs> That's great. Well, just hang on a second. We'll say a proper goodbye. But thanks again for being a guest on the podcast. It was real thanks, pleasure. Thanks, Jared. I'm looking forward to seeing you. this. Thank you. Yeah.